Okay. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3. Let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Now you recall we've divided the book of Philippians into four very simple sections and they all involve and revolve around joy. Chapter 1 deals with joy in suffering. Chapter 2, joy in serving. Chapter 3, joy in believing. And chapter 4 deals with joy in giving. Now last time we were together, we had completed the second section dealing with joy in serving. And we looked at four examples in light of having joy in serving the Lord. And we saw in all of that that our joy is really not based on our circumstances. It's not based on our situation. Our joy is based in, through, and because of Jesus Christ. That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. Well, this brings us to the third section of the book here in chapter 3, dealing with joy in believing. And all of chapter 3 involves the fact that we have joy in believing that our righteousness doesn't come about by good works but our righteousness comes about by faith in the good work of Jesus Christ. So let's pick up our reading in verse 1, and we'll read down through verse 11 in our study today. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worshiped God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, <laughs> persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. But indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, as we've mentioned, this section in chapter 3 deals with joy and believing. And the context, of course, deals with righteousness. And we can have true joy in believing that our righteousness isn't based on our good works. It's based on faith in Christ alone. And uh, this is really what Paul is going to develop and highlight in our study today. So if you're taking notes or uh, outlining our text, we're going to look at two things. First of all, we're going to look at righteousness um, by works, that's verses 1 through 6. And second, we'll look at righteousness by faith in verses 7 through 11. So let's drop back and look at this first section. It's the first six verses dealing with righteousness by works. And we would mention three things in this first section. Uh, number one, first of all, let's take a look at the care of Paul has, the care Paul has. We see that in verse 1. Take a look. In verse 1, Paul said, finally, my brethren, and then like any good preacher, he goes on for two more full chapters. He said, <laughs> he said rejoice in the Lord. Now, the idea here in dealing with righteousness by faith becomes pretty significant. He says to rejoice in the Lord. In other words, we do not rejoice in our church attendance. We do not rejoice in our tithes and offerings. We do not rejoice in our good works. We rejoice in the Lord. In fact, when we get to chapter 4, verse 4, Paul says this. He says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say, rejoice. Yeah. And then at the end of verse 1, he said, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, it's not 
tiring, but for you, it is safe. And here Paul demonstrates the care he has for them by writing the same thing to them. You see, Paul cares so much for the church that he's willing to write the same thing to them regarding this issue of righteousness. Because the issue of righteousness becomes a very critical issue because a lot of people today think they're righteous based on what they do or their good works. But clearly, righteousness is based on faith alone in Christ alone. And you know, oftentimes as we go through the scriptures, we cover some of the same material over and over again. In fact, sometimes as I'm studying and preparing for the next message, I'll think, you know, we just covered this last week. We just talked about this the week before. And then I remember Philippians chapter three, verse one, when Paul says it's not tedious to write the same thing, but for us, it is safe. And it's safe for us to be reminded of the fact that we are made righteous, not by good works, but by faith. And that, listen carefully, precious family, that is what separates every single religion on the face of the planet today from biblical Christianity. Every single religious group today is based on good works or good deeds, thinking that somehow if I do the right thing or do the good work that I'll make right, I'll become righteous. But biblical Christianity is becoming righteous based on the finished work of Christ on the cross and his shed blood. In fact, Romans 5.19 says, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Same thing in 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Well, back to Philippians chapter three. Let's come to the second thing we wanna look at in this first section, dealing with righteousness by works. Now, we've looked at the care Paul has. Now let's take a look at the contrast Paul gives. The contrast Paul gives. That's in verses two and three. And the contrast is between the false worshiper in verse two and the true worshiper in verse three. Now in verse two, dealing with the false worshiper, Paul gives us three things that characterize them, three attributes of the false worshiper. Note them carefully. First of all, he calls them dogs. He said in verse two of Philippians two, beware of dogs. Now the word dog, Kuen is only used five times in the entire New Testament. It's a very derogatory term. It speaks of a wild dog, the dogs that run in packs that are very vicious and very dangerous. And the Jews viewed the Gentiles as dogs, a very um, degrading term. <laughs> you know, I'll never forget many years ago when my granddaughter was growing up, uh, she was taught sign language by my son, her father. So I was teaching her some Hebrew based on sign language. And uh, one thing for sign language, when you pat your thigh, that means dog, okay? So, and dog in Hebrew is kelef. Well, I was teaching her to say, how are you? Which is mashlom cha, but that's very proper. So I shortened it for the more slang version, manishma. Manishma is like, what's up? So one day, Colonel Shalom Amog, a full bird colonel, a good friend of mine from Israel, came to our home, and here is McKenna. She walks up to Colonel Shalom, and I introduce them, and she says, Manishma Kelev. <laughs> that means, what's up, dog? <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at her, he said, Ani lo Kelev, I'm no dog. And I said, no, Colonel, Colonel, no, no, it's kind of an American slang, like, how are you, what's up, kind of, and he goes, oh, okay, anyway. But the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the point, <laughs> Yes, it's a very derogatory term and you'd really don't want to use it in Israel. <laughs> Number two, the second attribute is the evil workers, according to verse two. Now in the context, it deals with those who are teaching the people that righteousness comes by good works, not by faith. He calls them evil workers. And you know, it's very sad and tragic that there are many so-called mainstream denominations today who teach this very thing. Paul says it's evil. Now the third attribute that characterizes these false worshipers 
is mutilation, according to the end of verse 2. He says, beware of the mutilation. This word mutilation is only used here. And Paul is drawing a very powerful point because in the same breath in verse 3, he mentions circumcision. Now the word mutilation means to cut off. The word circumcision means to cut around. And the point is, no matter what kind of extreme measures we may take externally to become righteous, we never will. No matter how far you take it externally, dealing with the flesh, there is nothing we can do to become righteous in and of ourselves. So Paul deals with these false worshipers. Number two. Second, the contrast, he deals with the true worshipers. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, there are three attributes that characterizes them. Number one, the first thing that characterizes the true worshiper is they worship in spirit. In Philippians 3, 3, Paul said, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Now, back in John chapter 4, when Jesus was at the woman with the well, at the well with the woman at the well. You remember the story? He subsequently tells her in verse 20 of John chapter 4 and on that those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth because God is spirit. And so Paul here carries this idea to the church at Philippi in telling them that worshiping God isn't just about an external action. It's about an internal attitude. It's not just about what we do. It's about what's in our heart. And when we worship God, we worship God by the power of God's spirit, not the power of the flesh. Well, the second attribute is they rejoice in Christ, according to verse 3. He says, rejoice in Christ Jesus. And This is basically the same point he made back in verse 1, that we're to rejoice in the Lord. Look, our rejoicing isn't based on our good works. We don't rejoice in religiosity. We don't rejoice in our church attendance, in our tithes and offerings. We don't rejoice in any of these external actions, though they're good, don't misunderstand. But we don't rejoice in all of that. No, we rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because only the Lord can make us righteous. Only the Lord can impute his righteousness to us. And it's not based on good works. And the third attribute at the end of verse 3 is having no confidence in the flesh. Having no confidence in the flesh. Our confidence is not about circumcision, external fleshly actions, or any kind of religious observation. No, our confidence in becoming righteous is based on the finished work of Christ on the cross. And I realize this becomes very redundant. And this is basically the same thing over and over again. But you know, (laughs) Paul said, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for us it's safe. Look, it's just safe for us to hear over and over and over again that our righteousness isn't based on our good works. It's not based on some kind of religious observant. It's not based on rites and rituals, rules and regulations. No, it's based on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I say praise God to that. Back to Philippians chapter 3. Well, let's come to the third and final point in this first section, dealing with righteousness by works. And we've looked at the care Paul has We looked at the contrast Paul gives. Now number three, let's take a look at the confidence Paul had. The confidence Paul had, that's in verses four through six. Take a look. In Philippians chapter three, verse four, Paul said, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Look, if you think you're made righteous by your good works, you should look at me. Because my good works far outweigh your good works. So if you think you're righteous by your good works, just think how righteous I am. Follow me? That's the point that Paul is making. So what does Paul do? Well, in verses 5 and 6, he gives us seven areas in which he has, could have absolute confidence in his flesh that he could be made righteous. Take a look. Number one, 
The first, of course, is circumcision in verse 5. Paul said he was circumcised on the eighth day. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the covenant of circumcision was, of course, given by God to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 17. But it was not given to make Abraham righteous. It was to make Abraham set apart. It was to make Abraham different than everyone else. Because Abraham was, in fact, made righteous two chapters earlier in Genesis 15. In Genesis 15, 6, the Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. So when Paul says he was circumcised on the eighth day, he recognizes that this is an ordinance of God. And if anybody had confidence in the flesh, it would be him. Number two, it was, <clears throat> he also mentions he's the stock of Israel. The word stock is the word genos. We get our word genealogy. So Paul's genealogical background, his ancestry, we would say, are those of the Jews. His mother and father were both Israelites. Number three, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> that was good. <clears throat> Number three, the third is he is the tribe of Benjamin, according to verse five, the tribe of Benjamin. Now this becomes kind of a big deal because Benjamin was the 12th and final son of Jacob. The first king of Israel saw was of the tribe of Benjamin. In fact, only the tribe of Benjamin stayed with Rehoboam at the death of Solomon in 930 BC when the kingdom of Israel was divided. You remember when King Solomon died? His servant, Jeroboam, took 10 of the tribes and went north. And then the tribe of Judah and Benjamin stayed in the south with Rehoboam, Solomon's son. So Benjamin was the only faithful tribe with Judah in 930 BC. Number four, in verse five, he says he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Now this is different than him being of the stock of Israel. Being a Hebrew of the Hebrews indicates that he did not fall into the Grecian culture. He did not become Hellenistic, we might say, because a lot of Jews during this period of time were adapting the Grecian culture and the Grecian language. They became very Hellenistic. Paul indicates he did not. Number five, the fifth thing that makes him confident in the flesh is he was a Pharisee, according to verse five, a Pharisee. Now, the Pharisees believed in the entire Old Testament, what we call the Tanakh. Uh, the word Tanakh is simply uh, uh, an abbreviation for the, 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 the law, the prophets, and the writings, the Torah, Navi'im, Vahakatuvim, so the law, the prophets, and the writings. But the Sadducees only believed in the first five books of the Bible, which are the Pentateuch or the books of Moses. In fact, according to Acts chapter 23, verse 9, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead, they believed in spirit beings, and they believed in angels. But the Sadducees did not. Now, this brings us to a seventh area in which he had confidence in the flesh in verse, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, the sixth area in verse six, and that is he is persecuting the church. In verse six, it says concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Did Paul persecute the church? Oh yes. In Acts chapter nine, verse one, the Bible says he breathed murderous threats against the church. In Acts 22, 4, he persecuted them to death and to prison. In fact, in Galatians 1, 13, it says he persecuted them beyond measure. Which brings us to the seventh and final attribute of Paul's confidence in the flesh, and that is he was blameless, according to the end of verse 6. Now, when it says he was blameless, it doesn't mean he was perfect. The context in verses five and six is dealing with spiritual things. The connotation is spiritual. It all deals with religiosity, we would say. So when it says he was blameless, he was blameless as it pertained to the law, we might say. He 
attended all the feasts, all the festivals, all the new moons and Sabbaths. He performed all the sacrifices, the tithes, the offerings. He never missed synagogue, we might say, in our modern day vernacular. And in all of these things, we see that Paul could have had great confidence in his flesh because he did everything right. But the point is, if you think you are righteous by your good works, look at me because my good works far exceed your good works, Paul would say. Therefore, I must be more righteous than you. Now, that's the idea dealing with righteousness by works. Back to Philippians chapter 3. Let's come to the second and final section. We've looked at righteousness by works. Now Paul is going to deal with righteousness by faith in verses 7 through 11. Righteousness by faith. And you know, before Paul met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, spiritually speaking, he was blind because he thought righteousness came by good works. But after he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, even though he was blind physically, he could see spiritually because he saw very clearly that righteousness came by faith alone in Christ alone. And we would mention two things about that in verses 7 through 11. Number one, the first thing involves the loss Paul had. The loss Paul had. That's in verses 7 and 8. Take a look. In Philippians 3, 7, Paul said, but what things were gained to me, all of my religious observance, all of these wonderful things that I thought were good for me, these I have counted loss for Christ. All of my religious accomplishments, all of my external actions, all the works of my flesh, man, they mean nothing to me. I count them all as rubbish. They're all loss for the sake of Christ. But, verse 8 Indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. It's trash. Why? That I may gain Christ. Two things here in verse 8. First of all, Paul just didn't count his religious actions as rubbish. He counted everything as rubbish. You know everything we have is rubbish. All of our stuff, everything we own. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with having nice rubbish. (laughs) God's blessed us with some really nice trash, some beautiful rubbish, and and we we should appreciate it. We should take good care of it. We should use it to honor God with it, but ultimately, it's all rubbish. It's all trash. Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, that the heavens and earth are going to melt with fervent heat. You know, everything we own is firewood. You know that, right? Now, it might be beautiful, shiny, brand new firewood, and that's okay. Look, if, if God's blessed you with some beautiful stuff, right on. Give God glory for it. Praise the Lord because of it. But realize it's all rubbish. Don't hold on to it too tightly. Because when we hold on to things too tightly, God has a tendency to pry our little stingy fingers open and take it out of our hand. Does anybody understand what we're talking about? Yeah, a few of us don't. We understand that. No, it's better just to praise God for it and hold it with an open hand and say, God, this is your pile of trash. (laughs) This is your rubbish. So Lord, you do with it as you see fit. I'm just going to keep an open hand with it. But Paul counted it all as lost. But the second thing to note in verse 8, and this is subtle, but the Greek grammar indicates this was an action that Paul kept on doing. Wow. In other words, counting everything as lost wasn't a one-time deal. It's something that Paul did over and over and over again, which becomes pretty significant. Because as it pertains to religiosity and good works, One problem we face is we have a tendency to fall back to the rubbish, to the trash, thinking that somehow my good works are important as it pertains to my righteousness. And the reason is because when we do something good, when we do a good deed or a good work, it makes us feel good about ourselves, and we feel righteous. Righteous. 
But the problem with that is that when we don't do a good work, when we don't do a good deed, it makes us feel bad and we feel unrighteous. Follow me? But righteousness isn't based on our, on our performance. It's not based on what we do or what we don't do. And Paul here in verse 8 makes it clear that everything is trash and subtly implies that we need to keep remembering it's trash. Well, let's come to the second and final thing in this second section, dealing with righteousness by faith. We looked at the loss Paul had. Now let's take a look at the gain Paul received, the gain that Paul received. That's in verses 9 through 11. Now back in verse 8, Paul said he counted everything as loss. The reason he recognizes everything is rubbish, everything is trash for two reasons back in verse 8. Number one, it's to know Christ. And number two, it's to gain Christ. That's the whole reason he counted everything as loss, to know Christ and to gain Christ. In fact, in, down in verse 10, he says that I may know him. Uh, in verse 9, it talks about being found in him. So as we put this whole situation together, we see that Paul counted everything as lost, everything as trash for two reasons, to know Christ and to gain Christ to set aside all of his religiosity, all of his good works. He made a switch in his life from religion to relationship, from duty to desire, from the law to love, from a got to to a get to. Boy, what a beautiful thing this is in Paul's life, a Pharisee of the Pharisee. Well, Paul mentions four things that are involved in this gain that he received. Note them carefully. First of all, it involves the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. Look at verse 9. Paul said in Philippians 3, 9, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So righteousness is a gift. Righteousness isn't based on our performance. Paul there in verse 9 talks about his own righteousness. Now, this is something all of us need to understand, that our own righteousness, well, according to Isaiah 64, 6, is as of filthy rags. Our own righteousness is not righteous at all. But when I gain Christ, when I know Christ, I then receive righteousness from Christ. In fact, Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 61, 10 says that he has given me the, the cloak of salvation. He has wrapped me in the robe of righteousness. And when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, when we bow the knee and confess our sin and ask him to become our Lord and Savior, he not only forgives us of our sin, uh, Psalm 103, 12, Hebrews 10, 17, 1 John 1, 9, but he cleanses us of all unrighteousness and imputes his righteousness to us, as we saw in Romans 5.19, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Isaiah 61.10. We now have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. And this becomes pretty significant. Because when you look at me, you shake your head and say, oh, Clark. But when God looks at me, he goes, ah, oh, Clark, <laughs> big difference. Why? Well, because God sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ, credited to my account. He doesn't see my faults and flaws, all my failures, and there are many. Just ask Sally, she'll tell you. But he sees his righteousness. And note carefully, class, this comes by faith according to verse 9. It's by faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Twice it talks about faith. Now, all of us have faith. Romans 12, 3 says, God's dealt to each man a measure of faith. We all have faith. So the question is, where are we putting it? If we're putting our faith in our own good works to become righteous, <laughs> we have little faith. But if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, to make us righteous, now we have great faith because there's no greater object we can put our faith in for righteousness than Jesus Christ. And that's something that we have to receive by faith. 
because I can't see God's righteousness imputed to me. But he can. And by faith, I believe it. Well, number two. The second thing that's mentioned or involved in dealing with gaining Christ and knowing Christ involves the power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection. Look at verse, look at verse 10. It says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Now, when we're talking about the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, wow. I mean, we can spend weeks and weeks and weeks talking about the power of Jesus Christ. It's the cornerstone of our Christianity, by the way. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, in verse 14, he said, if Christ is not risen, our preaching is vain and our faith is vain. Look, if Jesus Christ is not raised from the dead, we might as well just close up shop and go home. Everything we believe in, everything we're doing is all for naught. It's all vanity. So yes, it's the cornerstone of our, our Christian faith. But it is also, are you ready for this? It is also our living hope. According to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter said, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Man, it's that living hope that you and I have for right here, for right now, because of the resurrection. But it's not just for a living hope now. The resurrection of Jesus Christ also guarantees our resurrection when we die. Look at verse 11. Drop down to Philippians chapter 3, verse 11. Paul said, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. How glorious is that? You and I are guaranteed to be raised from the dead because Christ is raised from the dead. And the resurrection of Christ is what separates every religious group from biblical Christianity. Not just their idea of working for righteousness, but the fact that they don't believe that Christ raised from the dead. Look, if you don't believe Jesus raised from the dead, there's no eternal life. There's no hope. There's no resurrection of the dead. You say, okay, Clark, fine, I get it. But when will we be resurrected from the dead? Well, that's a good question. It'll happen at the rapture of the church. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, when Jesus Christ descends from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God blows, and the dead in Christ rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds. Again, in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58, we're going to be resurrected from the dead. You say, well, what about if I'm cremated? Can God still raise me from the dead? Oh, Yes. Look, it doesn't matter if you're buried or burned because what the grave does in 37 years, the furnace does in 37 seconds. Look, it's ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And if God can speak a word and the universe has leapt into existence, don't you think he can resurrect us from the dead no matter? You say, but I, I scattered Uncle Ed's ashes all over the ocean. Do you think God can? Oh, yes, God can take care of that too. Don't worry. <laughs> Now, it's interesting to know that our resurrection will happen at the rapture of the church. However, it would seem that the resurrection of the Old Testament believers will be resurrected at the end of the seven years of tribulation, according to Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, as well as the tribulation martyrs, which leads me to personally believe that the marriage supper of the Lamb does not happen in heaven during the seven years of tribulation. No, it happens on earth during the millennial kingdom. Because according to Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, the Bible says that you and I are going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How can we sit down with them unless they're raised from the dead? And how can the tribulation martyrs and the Old Testament believers partake in the marriage supper of the Lamb if they're not raised from the dead? Follow me? Kind of interesting, or not. <laughs> number three, number three. The third thing involves fellowship of his suffering. I hate this one. Take a look at verse 10 again. In the middle of the verse, it says, and the fellowship of 
his suffering. So what does it mean to know Christ, to gain Christ? (laughs) Well, it means to suffer with Christ. Wow. You say, well, Clark, I'm all for this power thing in verse 10, but the suffering, I'm not so sure about. Well, wait a minute. They go hand in hand. In fact, Jesus promised us suffering. In John 16, 33, he said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Woo, yeah, okay. I'm not very thrilled about that either. Have you ever wondered what your calling in life is? God, what have you called me to do in this world? Well, wonder no more. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, Peter said, To this you are called, here's your calling, that Christ suffered that you should follow in his footsteps. That's your calling in life. Isn't that exciting? Now, as difficult as that is for us to get excited about, it is important for us to understand that as we take that step back, man, we have joy in believing not just in the power of the resurrection, but in the fellowship of his suffering. That no matter what's happening in, to, or around us, it's all being filtered through the fingertips of God. Look, if we're a child of God, God is either A, allowing it to happen, or B, he's making it happen. Either way, God's in control. And the truth of the matter is, God knows what he's doing, whether we like it, agree with it, understand it or not. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. Romans eleven thirty four 34 says, who knows the mind of God? Who is his counselor? <laughs> well, it ain't us. And when we get that, when we truly understand that, there's going to be joy, joy in believing that. Well, let's come to the fourth and final thing, and we'll wrap this up right here. It deals with conforming to his death. The fourth and final thing that's involved in knowing Christ and gaining Christ is conforming to his death according to the end of verse 10. Paul said, being conformed to his death. Now, when we talk about the death of Christ, we talk about something that's very sacrificial, obviously. He willingly died for us to demonstrate his great love for us, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And it speaks of a selfless, sacrificial act. So for you and for me, joy in believing as we gain Christ and as we know Christ, it involves conforming to the death of Christ. We're going to set aside our own selfish wants and desires, our own will. And we're going to have joy in believing that Well, our faith is in Christ. And we're going to bring our will in line with his will. Which is an important issue for all of us. Because oftentimes we come up with a plan. We come up with an idea. And we think, ooh, this is a good plan. Man, this is is perfect. God, you really need to get behind this plan. Because, I mean, obviously it's awesome. So God just blessed my plan. Follow me? Rather than saying, God, I have no idea what's going on. I need you desperately in my life. God, I need your I need your plan. I need your purpose. I need your perfect will. I'm relinquishing my will to your will. I want to conform to your death as it speaks of that sacrificing what I want and what I desire to what God wants and what He desires in our life. And when that's the case, precious family. There's going to be joy, joy in believing that righteousness comes by faith alone in Christ alone. Father, how thankful we are. Lord, for these few short minutes to be able to come and gather together, to set aside the cares and concerns of the day, for there are many, and just simply and wholly learn of you, to worship you, to lift up our hearts and our hands to you. And Lord, we pray that by your spirit, you would help each and every one of us, Lord, to be those that simply find that great joy in believing that you've made us righteous 
and that our lives would be a reflection of that. Let it be so, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer today for anything at all, be sure to come on up after service. The pastors and the brothers and the sisters will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you. And don't forget, right after third service, if you'd like to get baptized, maybe you'd like to get re-baptized and rededicate your life to the Lord. Or maybe you'd like to get baptized with your spouse or maybe your entire family. Come on back after third service. Just bring a towel and a bathing suit. We've got robes and uh, the baptism's all ready to go. So right after third service, be sure to come on back. If you'd just like to be a part of it and witness the the guys and gals who are going to be making that public profession of their faith through water baptism, you can be a part of that as well. So may God bless you. May he watch over you. May he lead, guide, and direct you. May he provide miraculously for you and do a great and mighty work in and through you. I love you guys. God bless you. Have a a great week in Jesus. Thank you.